Acts 10, 34 through 43. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace, through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Colossians 1, uh, 3, 1-4 If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Matthew 28 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where they lay him, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God in heaven, we thank you on this day when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, for that resurrection, for the death that preceded it, in which Jesus took upon himself our death, our sin, in our place. We thank you that death could not hold him, and that by his resurrection he proved himself to be the Son of God, to be worshipped. We pray now that as we meditate in your word, as we hear your word, 
that you will continue to give us the gift of faith, that we might put our full confidence in Jesus and what he has done for us. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I don't know, is it an odd question to ask on Easter morning? Of what are we, of what are you, of what am I afraid? As we read through the text, the account of the resurrection that Matthew recorded for us, we see fear throughout the text. Four times actually, but we're going to look at three of those. And as we look at how fear is in and throughout the story, ask ourselves, of what are we afraid? And of what do we not need to be afraid? So let's walk our way through the text and see, first of all, the fear of those who guarded the tomb. We're reminded that towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Sunday, we're gathered here today, Sunday, or we gather wherever the church gathers, most of us, the great majority of us, on Sunday, not only on Easter Sunday, but on each Sunday, in memory of, in celebration of the resurrection. So let's just back up a little bit and see how it is that we get to dawn on the first day of the week. On the previous Thursday night, Jesus met with his disciples to celebrate the Passover, and in that meeting, in that meal, Jesus revealed to his disciples the true meaning of the Passover. As he took from the pieces of the meal, the bread, broke it and gave it to them, this is my body. As he took from the meal, probably the cup that is called the cup of redemption, gave it to them and said, this is my blood of the new covenant, told them to eat and to drink, and to do that whenever they did it in memory of him. That was Thursday. That night, he was arrested. He was tried. He was taken before the Roman authorities, who we are told in Scripture were the only ones who had authority to carry out a sentence of death against a criminal. The Roman governor could find no reason to crucify him or to put him to death as the Jews demanded as the religious leaders demanded. But he was afraid, afraid of a riot, afraid of an uprising. He didn't want to have to call the Roman army soldiers to task, to put down a revolt, and so he conceded. And the sentence of death was that Jesus was king of the Jews. Presumably, then, as king of the Jews, one who was rising up to overthrow the Roman government, and I suppose in some way gave legitimacy to Pilate to carry out what was done. That was Friday. Saturday was the Sabbath. The last day, the seventh day of the week. And as we look back on this great event, this event that stands at the crossroads of history and changes everything, we recognize 
that the work that Jesus did on the cross was finished there, and that on the Sabbath he rested just as God rested on the seventh day of creation. And so now then we find ourselves at dawn on the first day of the week. And we are told that the women, these are followers of Jesus, uh, two of them are named by Matthew, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. The other gospel writers tell us that there were other women as well who went out to the tomb. Other, the other gospel writers indicate to us that the burial on Friday had been a hasty burial. Sunset was approaching and the Sabbath was beginning when no work was to be done. And so Jesus' body, though it was wrapped in cloths and put in a tomb, was not properly anointed for burial. And the women were going out then on the first day of the week when the Sabbath had finished in order to accomplish, in order to do that task for the man they loved. But when they got there, they recognized that things had changed. Now whether or not they felt the earthquake, we don't know, we're not told. We're simply told that there was an earthquake, and that the earthquake was caused by the descending of an angel of the Lord, who rolled the stone away from the tomb, and who sat on the stone. And here is where we then find our first fear that those who had been appointed to guard the tomb, and the reason there was a guard set on the tomb is because the religious leaders had heard that Jesus said he would rise from the dead, and believed, or at least said they believed, that Jesus' followers would come, steal the body away, in order to proclaim a resurrection. So a guard had been placed at the tomb to prevent the body from being stolen, and as Matthew tells us the event of the earthquake and the descent of the angel, he says to us that fear of the angel came upon the guards, and they trembled and became like dead men. What were they afraid of? Well, certainly I suppose I would shiver a little bit, my knees might shake, and maybe even more than that, I might become like a dead man if an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared with an earthquake. And yet I want to suggest that there is a deeper cause for fear here, because when the angel rolled away the stone, it wasn't so that Jesus could be raised from the dead. When the angel rolled away the stone, it was to reveal that the grave was already empty. And for the unbeliever, that ought to cause a great deal of fear. The, the guards knew that there was a man who died. The guards knew that there was a man who was placed in that tomb, whose body was placed in that tomb. The guards knew that no one had come in the night to roll the stone away, and yet now, with the earthquake and the appearing of this angel and the rolling of the stone away, it is revealed that the tomb is empty. At that moment, as we read the chronology in Matthew's Gospel, the woman arrived at the tomb, and the angel says to the woman, the very first thing the angel says to the woman is, do not be afraid. And then he has this conversation with them. I guess it's kind of one-sided conversation, but it's an announcement to them. He knows why they're there, but he is also telling them that what they have come to see is not there. That who they come to see is not there. 
But it begins, the conversation or the, the declaration begins to them with, do not be afraid. The fact that Jesus is raised from the dead is not a cause for fear. Yes, it was a cause for fear for those who guarded because they were living outside of faith. And, and I, I would hope and believe that some of those eventually came to faith based on what they saw and based on the witness of Jesus' disciples who also saw but Jesus is saying to the women, you don't need to, or the angel is saying to the women, you don't need to be afraid of the emptiness of the tomb. Yes, Jesus died. Yes, Jesus was buried. But he has been raised from the dead. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come see the place. And so to the women, he is saying, they have no cause for fear. And I would suggest that those words can be spoken to us as well, that the empty tomb actually frees us from fear, from fear of sin, from fear of eternal death, from fear of death itself, unless Jesus should return within our lifetimes, we are all going to die. But we need not be afraid of death because if we are in Jesus, then we are alive. And as we read in our Colossians text, if we are in Christ, then we will also be in glory with Christ. That death has no hold on those who believe, that death has no hold on those who are in Christ, and we do not need to be afraid. And then, in order to emphasize for us this wonderful truth, as the women are going back into Jerusalem, I guess, they, they haven't gone back to Galilee yet, although the angel did tell them, you guys all need to go up to Galilee, and Jesus will meet you there. Although we find out, and you know, he does, Jesus does do that, but Jesus does meet them. Behold, it says that as the women were going to find the disciples, to let them know of the things that they had discovered at the tomb, that Jesus appeared to them. And that Jesus' word, first word to them was simply greetings. Greetings. He approached them not with scolding, but as a friend. And as one who would enter into and be in fellowship with them. And when they saw Jesus, as Matthew tells us the account, they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped. They recognized in the resurrected Jesus more than a man. And we do, we really don't have that sense until after the resurrection of Jesus being worshipped by his disciples. But now we have, for the first time, a complete recognition of what all of this means, that there can be no one greater than God to be raised from the dead. And if he is indeed raised from the dead and they are seeing his risen body, then their conclusion is that he is to be worshipped. And then again we have the word fear. Well, they 
in fear and trembling, and in joy, we're going away. But then we, we come back to what Jesus said to them at the end of our gospel this morning. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Do not be afraid. I wonder if in our society today we've kind of lost the fear. Fear of what? Well, we might be afraid that we'll lose our jobs, or we might be afraid of getting sick, or, but, but I, I wonder, are we, are we wrestling, do we wrestle as a society with what we ought to really be afraid of? And are we willing to really hear the words of both the angel and more importantly of Jesus, because the angel is a messenger of what Jesus says to us? That we need not fear death, that we not need fear an eternal separation from God when we believe in Jesus. When we come up to him, and I suppose for us it's metaphorical, and take hold of his feet, but in reality worship him, because he is God come to us, because he is God taking, who took on human flesh so that human flesh could die human sin, for human sin, and so that we could be forgiven. We can hear the words of the angel, and more importantly, we can hear the words of Christ. The words of the angel because they are given to him the message from God to us. The words of Christ himself, whom we worship today, that as we put our faith in him, our sins are forgiven. That as we put our faith in him, we are brought into fellowship with him. We are reconciled to him. He greets us with greetings. That as we put our faith in him, we will see him in eternity. Gracious God in heaven, we give you thanks for this day again when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And really, we are giving you thanks for that resurrection for the death that preceded it, for the forgiveness of sins that was won for us on the cross, and for the victory over sin and death that is proven by the resurrection. So again, we pray for faith, that we would put our trust in what Jesus did for us, for the forgiveness of our sins, for reconciliation, and for the promise of glory eternal. We ask in Jesus' name.